when I was six years old, I remember waking up to the smell of bacon and eggs cooking in the kitchen. I could hear my mom in there clinging around with dishes. I was so excited. I jumped up, ran down the hallway in my pink snowflake pajamas, and I stood in the kitchen doorway ready to say good morning. My mom turned around. She was holding pots and pans. And when she saw me, she dropped them. Food went everywhere. She froze. When I was six years old, my mother and stepdad spent the day in the kitchen drinking and fighting. I spent the day in my bedroom hiding, hoping they wouldn't remember that I was in there. When night, when night fell um, and it was quiet, I tiptoed into the kitchen to try and find some food. And what I found was the chaos and destruction of the day. I was reaching for some bread, and I heard something behind me. And I turned, and I saw my mother in the doorway. And then I saw the belt, and I froze. Our body holds on to memories. And later in life, when those memories surface, they often cause us to react to our world. The prefrontal part of the brain is not developed until we're in our mid-20s, and it's responsible for our logical reasoning, our problem solving. You go back even further, and you'll find thoughts and where our language lies. You go back even further, and you'll find the limbic system, otherwise known as the survival brain, the lizard brain. Now, the limbic system is fully developed when we're born, and it believes everything it's told. So, if the limbic system is shown that a relationship looks like mom and dad fighting and there's alcohol and abuse, the limbic system says, got it, that's what a relationship looks like. If the limbic system is shown through the people and the systems in our lives that the way to navigate this world is to impulsively react to it, the limbic system says, duly noted, that is how I will behave until we make a conscious effort to do something different. Now, there are six survival reactions that live in this part of the brain. In fact, the limbic brain cares about one thing and one thing only, and that is our survival. The reactions that live in this part of the brain are fight, flight, freeze, faint, fornicate, and feed. Now, we know what fight looks like. People hurl insults at each other, um, people get defensive, we also know what flight looks like. I mean, somebody walks out of the relationship or the interaction because it's too stressful. Freeze is what happened to you that day in the kitchen. Faint can literally be fainting, but it can also look like the need for sleep when life is stressful and overwhelming. Fornicate can be a poor addiction. It can be excessive uh, flirting. It can also be the need for sexual intimacy when life is crazy. And then there's feed. And feed can be excessive eating, under eating, working too much, working out too much, hoarding, drugs, alcohol. All of these are the survival brain's way of saying, danger, I don't feel safe here. And the only way that I know how to survive this moment is to do one of these things. Oh my gosh, during the pandemic, which F did each of you go to? I mean, really, here, here our safety was, our health and safety was compromised. We were, we were overwhelmed. We were confused. Which F were you? I know I went to feed. I obsessively cleaned. Um, I do have a story that depicts a couple of the reactions. We were leaving my uncle's house, and my mother shoved me in the car, and she got behind the wheel, drunk. We were headed for home, and the police pulled up behind us. And my mother stepped on the gas, and the chase was on. I begged her to slow down. She said if the police stopped us, that she would go to jail, and she didn't know what would happen to me. I curled up in a ball and wished I could disappear. Now, a few years ago, I was driving home from work, and the police pulled up behind me. Now, I did pull over, but, <laughs> but I was shaking. I was disoriented. I could not even remember where I always kept my driver's license. I was transported back 
to the traumatized little girl whose mother taught her to be afraid. The policeman walked up to my door, and he observed my behavior, and he just kind of talked to me for a little bit. And that safety provided me the time to come back into the moment. When we stress, we regress to the survival part of our brain. The blood is not flowing up here where we can problem solve and articulate exactly how we're feeling. The blood is going to our extremities so we can fight, fight, freeze, faint, fornicate, or feed. In these moments, our behavior becomes our language. Your behavior was your language that day. When your coworker is acting out at work, their behavior is their language. When your three-year-old is throwing a hissy fit because she can't have cocoa puffs, her behavior is her language. And what do we often do with behavior in this society? We often punish it. Now the good news is we don't have to stay back here. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But who else in our world cannot access their thoughts, and their language. Babies. And how are we with babies? We have a cadence to our voice. We lower our tone. We bring our body language in. We look for the need. We provide safety. Shh, shh, shh. I got you. You're okay. We'll figure this out. I often wonder why we lose that with people in our lives. Well, I think it's because we don't understand that there's another way one out of three disabled children are abused by their caregivers and it's out of frustration or their inability to read the behavior. 65% of marriages end in divorce due to communication issues. 42% of those couples report that they didn't have the skills for healthy conflict resolution. It's about connection before correction. Connection and safety before writing that speeding ticket, before writing that employee up, before delivering a consequence to our, our kiddos. Safety is the only way that we can get from here to here. In mental health, we have a saying, the strongest central nervous system wins. Not necessarily the loudest or the happiest or the angriest, the strongest one can take over an entire room. After the George Floyd murder, there were protests in this country in which people showed up aggressive. The police often showed up combative and aggressive, and mass chaos ensued. People got hurt. Everybody was in their survival brain. Now, there were also protests in which government officials and officers made a conscious decision to show up emotionally regulated. In some of these, you know, police officers were playing music, broke out into dance. Before long, the entire crowd was joining in. The strongest nervous system resulting in a reaction. The strongest nervous system resulting in a response. How are you going to show up in your world? I have a pie chart that I do at the end of every month. And I put all the things on the slices that I value in my life, that I know are going to fill me up and keep me emotionally regulated. I then color in the slice to the amount of time and energy and effort that I've given to that thing. This is the one I did last month. And as you can see, it's pretty out of balance. If I continue this way next month, I will destroy my relationships. I will lash out, I will shut down, and I will do damage. The systems in this country are often built on foundations of chaos and desperation. Our family life, our work life in this culture is stressed. And, and we are so numbed out on adrenaline that we have forgotten how to assess where we're at during the day. You wake up in the morning, you've got an early morning meeting, and your child is sick. You have a commute. And it's through road construction. You get to work and you have 30 emails you need to address right away. Four of them are people that are upset with you. If a friend plops down in the break room and starts talking about their divorce. I mean, mass shootings. The pandemic. Global warming. 
And this is what you present to your world. Now, if after work, sorry about that, if after work you decide that you're going to go for a run, that's great, and it's a start, but it's not enough. In this society, we are inundated with podcasts and books about self-care, and we try to work out after work. We, we try to start the day with a meditation, and then we wonder why we're still snapping at the people that we love and why our blood pressure is high, and why we can't sleep due to anxiety. This has to become an awareness throughout the day of what is going on and an intentionality about what we're going to do to take these off. I, I have an alarm that goes off on my phone three times a day, and a question pops up, and the question is, what does self-care look like right now? For me, it's enough to pull me out of the abyss. What is self-care? Oh, okay, a cup of hot tea. It could be that you actually pay attention to your Apple Watch when it's telling you to go for a walk. It could be that you put in your day timer at 3 p.m. every day, you're gonna stop for two minutes and assess where you're at and what you need. Take five deep breaths before you go into that boardroom. Stretch before that difficult phone call. Call a friend to talk you off the ledge. What if we did our relationships different in this world? What if our faculty meetings included a discussion about a child's disruptive behavior and the needs underneath that behavior? Does this child need connection? Do they need worth? Do they need safety? And our school plans were built on that, on those needs. What if our police departments, our firehouses, our military, the corporate world, started staff meetings with, what are each of you doing to take off the stress throughout your day? What if, as family members and roommates, we made agreements that we were going to tap out with each other when things got escalated and go to the yoga class or, or go for a drive and come back later when we're here and try the conversation again? What if, in the height of parenting, a toddler who will not stop screaming, we give ourselves a timeout? We back away, we put in our headphones, we listen to our favorite music before we do something that we are going to regret. What if when we parent an adolescent who's being defiant, we delay? Remember, connection before correction. And we say, what happened is not okay with me. There will be consequences when I am calm enough to give them. This has to become a balancing act of what goes on throughout the day and the little things that we do throughout the day to take them off, to emotionally regulate ourselves so that when the crisis comes, and you know it will, we will be able to handle it from here. When I was six years old, I had no safety in my home. I had no love. I was abandoned in an orphanage, and I was left there to spend the rest of my childhood unwanted, all because my mother chose not to come out of her survival brain. When I was six years old, I was given love and safety because my mother did make that choice. She, she got into therapy to deal with the trauma and the triggers that would have caused her to react to me. She made a million decisions every day to do the things she needed for her so that she could parent me from up here. You see, that's how we begin to change the dynamics of this world and turn it from one that is reactive and destroys to one that's responsive and heals and creates a new legacy.